Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Clara Jeffrey, Editor-in-Chief of Mother Jones, and your moderator for tonight's program. You can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. It's now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, former U.S. Secretary of Labor and author of the new book, The Common Good, Robert Reich. Secretary Reich has served in three administrations plus transition for the Obama administration, including, including of course, heading the Department of Labor under President Bill Clinton. Time Magazine named him one of the 10 most successful cabinet secretaries of the century. He's now a Chancellor's Professor in Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Reich is also a founding editor of the American Prospect Magazine, and his commentaries can be heard weekly on public radio's marketplace. Professor Reich has also written 13 books, including The Work of Nations, Supercapitalism, Aftershock, and Beyond Outrage. His, his uh, documentary and media company um, makes YouTube videos that are quite popular, and uh, two full-length documentaries, Inequality for All and Saving Capitalism. In his new book, The Common Good, he said that America is trapped in a downward cycle of whatever it takes politics that has left us more divided than ever. As a result, Americans are experiencing an erosion of trust in the media and other institutions, yawning income inequality, and the resurgence of overt racist movements. That's a lot, but don't despair, however, because he argues that this cycle can be reversed. To tell us how, please welcome Robert Reich. Thank you, Clark. Well, thank you, and thank you, Clara, and it's so nice to see you. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, Donald Trump has worn me down. <laughs> uh, when I was last here at the Commonwealth Club, George, I was 5'10", wasn't I? Uh, just about. <laughs> More seriously, uh, sometimes it, it is human nature uh, to take a lot of things for granted and then when we are in danger of losing them, discover how much value they actually are to us. And I think that to some extent that is what is happening in the country right now around the issue of democracy and our system of government, much of which we take for granted. I have spent much of the last 50 years in and out of government. My first job was as an intern in the summer of 1967 uh, for Senator, then Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And it was very exciting. It was not, uh, my job was not terribly glamorous. I was put in charge of uh, Robert F. Kennedy's signature machine. <laughs> In those days, uh, there was a pen at the end of a kind of a long wooden uh, kind of machine that you had, to, you had to turn it on. My job was actually to line up all of the letters that had been written by his secretaries, he called them, we called them those days, uh, and to all the constituents, and make sure that the Robert F. Kennedy pen was exactly in the right place. And I did that for about three months or so. I was getting very bored. And I decided one night I would sleep, I would kind of sneak into Senator Robert F. Kennedy's office. And I wrote on his stationery, on the typewriters there, for, uh, letters to my friends. <laughs> uh, and I wrote, you know, uh, Dear Mr. Dworkin, congratulations on having the largest nose in New York State. <laughs> Robert F. Kennedy, and it was going And uh, they still have these, and, if I, and they, they, on, they have it on their walls, and they... Uh, but one day, the reason I bring this up is that uh, uh, one day I was waiting in the corridor in the Senate office building, and the elevator opened, and there was, coming out, Senator Robert F. Kennedy and his aides, and I had seen almost nothing of the senator that whole three month period. I was just signing his name or making sure that the pen signed his name. And I was in awe, as you can imagine. And he looked at me 
as he was coming out. He was rushing around. He, he moved extremely fast. And he looked at me and he said, how's the summer going for you, Bob? <laughs> Bob, he called me. He knew my name. I almost couldn't believe my ears. And I, I mean, I was so struck that I couldn't speak. I just went, ha, ha, ha. And, <laughs> and I think that had he asked me to run his signature machine for another three months, I would have said yes, because well, because of respect, I think that's the word I'm searching for. Because just that little gesture of knowing my name, know who, knowing who was working for him in that little office with the signature machine, although he was surrounded by high-powered aides, that little slight show of respect charged me up and made me feel wonderful about what I was doing. You see, not that many years before, I had heard his brother, when John F. Kennedy was president of the United States at his inauguration, imploring us uh, not to ask what America can do for us, but what we can do for America. And in my own very, very small way, I thought, Years later, running that signature machine, particularly when he recognized me, Bob, <laughs> that I was doing a little something for America. American democracy is very fragile. And I think that the respect, going back to that word, that is so essential to it, respect for others, respecting people who work for us, respecting people who are of different views, different parties, is so essential. The rule of law, equal political rights, all now are surprisingly fragile. Years later, I went to Yale Law School. I had met two people already before I even went to law school that I went to law school with, and they were there in class. Uh, one was named Bill Clinton, and the other was named Hillary Rodham at that time. Uh, another person in that same class uh, with us was named Clarence Thomas. And uh, when the professor would ask a question, the first person with her <laughs> hand in the air was Hillary Rodham, and she almost every, when she was called upon, she got the question right almost every time. Uh, I was about the third or fourth, and I half the time got it wrong. Clarence Thomas never answered any question. <laughs> and Bill Clinton never came to class. <laughs> it's amazing how things continue on in various guises and forms. <laughs> but I had been inspired by that time, not just by John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, but also by somebody else who had been one of my protectors. I had always been very short, uh, and I had looked to older boys to kind of uh, protect me from the bullies. And when I was in college, I learned that one of my protectors, who was, again, six or seven years older than I was when I was a kid, really needing that kind of protection, uh, his name was Mickey Schwerner. And Mickey Schwerner, some of you may know Michael Schwerner, in the summer of 64, he was, along with two other civil rights workers, he had been tortured and murdered in Mississippi, and when I heard that my protector, somebody who had kept me from the bullies, had been tortured and murdered by the real bullies of America, I decided that I couldn't do anything else but try to respond to bullying in every form, every form there was. 
And so I was at Yale Law School because I, like Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham, and I assume Clarence Thomas and Richard Blumenthal was in that class, a lot of us, uh, we were there not to practice law. We were there because we wanted to make the country better. We wanted to make it stronger. We wanted to help the underdogs. We wanted to reduce the bullying. And I wish I could say that the country is much better. I didn't expect, honestly, what we are now witnessing. And I say this with full respect, going back to that word, for those of you who are Republicans, uh, I respect you. I don't like you, but I respect you. No, that's not true. I like you and respect you. Uh, one, of the, one of the real problems today, I, 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 I got a wind of the change, actually, uh, when I was Secretary of Labor for Bill Clinton. Uh, after Newt Gingrich came to his ascendancy as Speaker of the House, uh, it was almost as if the climate had suddenly changed, as if a uh, a different atmosphere, a different atmospheric pressure came to Washington. I remember because I, was, I had been testifying in November, before the change, before the big change, Newt Gingrich coming in as speaker, I was, had been testifying before the authorizing committee that was looking over uh, the Labor Department. It had responsibility for what I was doing as Secretary of Labor, and I, I would answer their questions, these members of Congress, and they would ask me more questions, and some of them, uh, Democrats as well as Republicans, would try to trip me up, and that was fine, and that was part of what we all did, and I, I was pretty well prepared. I tried to be as well prepared as I could, but then after in February, after Newt Gingrich came in and brought in a lot of others with him, I was testifying before the same committee. But there was a big difference. It was not the kind of almost good-natured ripping. I remember I, I was answering the question of one of the new members of Congress. I, I had never seen him before. His name was Duke Cunningham. I think it was Randy Cunningham. Some of you may remember this man, do you? Do you remember him? San Diego? San Diego? He went to prison, didn't he? <laughs> uh, well, this is before he went to prison. And, and, and he was asking, uh, I, I was trying to deliver testimony, and he, he interrupted me, and he said, uh, he said, Mr. Secretary, uh, I've read everything you've ever written, all your books, all your articles. And I thought for a quick instant that maybe he was going to say something nice. But he said, I've also read Karl Marx, and can you tell me what the difference is between you and Karl Marx? And he said it without a smile. And I didn't know whether he was joking, and I turned to my assistant and said, should I make a joke? <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> and I said, uh, Congressman, uh, there is a difference, and I'd be happy to talk with you about it when we have a chance. But that was just the beginning. I remember coming back to my office as Secretary of Labor and finding people I didn't know, people who were staffers, young people from the Republican side of the House who were going through my files. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we have permission to go through your files. And I said, what are you looking for? And they didn't answer me. And I went to my chief of staff, and I said, what are they looking for? And my chief of staff, she said, they're looking for anything they can find to get you. Do you see how quickly it changed? It was Newt Gingrich, and it was that year, 1995. Donald Trump is the culmination of something. He's not the cause. He's the culmination of years, and it's not just Republicans. Let me make sure you understand this. There has been a change in Washington. There's been a change in American politics. There's been a change in the ethics by which many of us have run and directed our lives. I saw it 
in business and in the business community as well. We used to have something called shareholder and stakeholder capitalism. The difference was that stakeholder capitalism, the older form of capitalism, was a form in which corporations had some responsibilities to all their stakeholders, not just their shareholders, but also their employees, also their communities. This building we're now in was the headquarters of Harry Bridges, the labor union leader. It wasn't always easy. There were some terrible things that happened around this building. Two labor employees, two labor leaders, two of his helpers were killed right on the street in front of this building. So I don't want to make the past seem more romantic than it was. But after the Second World War, there was more labor peace, and there was an assumption that corporations did have responsibilities to all of the stakeholders in the economy. And that changed in the 1980s. It changed not because anybody was a bad person, and I want to emphasize this with you too. I'm talking about the system, systemically. Things change systemically. It changed in part because with the advent of unfriendly takeovers, it became almost impossible for publicly held companies and their CEOs to do anything except maximize shareholder returns. And what we saw both in the public sector and also in the private sector, in government and in business, was the gradual seeping new ethic and ethos of whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to make money as much as possible, whatever it takes to gain political power as much as possible, without attending to the underlying institutions, the underlying social reality that was being ripped up in the process. By the time I was Secretary of Labor, I spent a lot of time in the Rust Belt, in the South, in parts of America that my cabinet colleagues, you know, one of the thing is, if you're Secretary of State, or even Secretary of the Treasury, or you're Secretary of the Interior, even the Interior, when you go to conferences, you go to the capitals of the world, you go to Paris and London and, and, and Beijing, and you go to wonderful, wonderful places. Now, I'm not in any way demeaning Toledo. <laughs> but I went to Toledo, and I went to Kansas City, and I went to every place where there were blue-collar workers in America, and I met with them. And I made relationships and friends, and I stayed in contact with them, and what I began to pick up, even in the 1990s, from a lot of these red states, or states that were going to become red states, was anger. Anger that people were working harder and harder and they weren't getting anywhere. Labor unions were shrinking for a number of reasons, partly because in order to maximize shareholder returns, you had to outsource or you had to go to states that didn't have labor unions. A lot of people were working harder and getting nowhere. And they told me that in the 1990s. And I went back to Washington to those congressional committees and to Bill Clinton and others and I told them what I was hearing. And I said, and I remember saying, and this isn't kind of I told you so, but I remember saying, you know, if we don't do anything to improve the plight of people who are working harder and getting nowhere, the median wage was flat. The economy was growing. If we don't do anything, there is going to be a problem here. I can't tell you what kind of problem, but it's not going to be pretty. And we didn't do enough. I wish we had done more. And the George W. Bush administration didn't do enough. And even the Obama administration didn't do enough. 
And we had almost a meltdown of the entire economy when Wall Street, Wall Street had been doing so much betting, betting the entire na national economy in order to make as much money as possible. Well, what happened? What happened was we bailed out Wall Street. We said we were going to bail out homeowners who were underwater, but they didn't get very much at all. And not a single Wall Street executive went to jail. And do you know how that played in the Rust Belt? and the South and the Midwest, in the red states as well as blue states, because I went out there and people were angrier than ever. And I heard people say, the game is rigged. It's rigged. It's rigged against us. And in 2015, two years before the election, at the start of 2015, when I went out to see people and talk to people that I knew in all of these cities and all of these states, blue collar workers, labor union leaders, people who were already angry, you know what they told me? They said, when I asked them, who are they considering for president? They said, well, we're considering either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. And I said, how can you how can you put those two people in the same sentence? And they said back to me, either one is going to shake up America. It's going to, they're going to shake up Washington. We can't go on as we're now going. And here we are. And Donald Trump, again, is a consequence, not the source, a consequence of a fundamental breakdown not a breakdown that's anybody, any individual's fault. It's a breakdown because we didn't pay enough attention. And so I say to a lot of people who say, well, I'm going to fight hard in the midterms in 2018 and then in 2020 to make sure that Donald Trump is no longer there, the Republicans are out. I say, focus, focus also. I don't care what you want to do politically, but focus on the bigger issue. What's going on in the country that caused all this? Focus on that anger, that desperation, that anxiety. Focus on the fear. We need to get on with what must be done. Now, let me summarize, and I'm gonna have, hopefully, a lot of time for your questions, and Clara's gonna help me. But let me summarize by saying that I am optimistic. Now that may surprise you, but I am optimistic. I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. I'm optimistic, number one, for the very reason I started out with. It is when we are losing something that people recognize its value. I have never heard in recent years so many people tell me how valuable our democracy is, how much they're going to fight for it, how concerned they are about it and how they understand that as citizens, their responsibility is not just to vote or be on juries and to pay their taxes, their responsibility is to be involved. I have not heard that much from people about engagement and involvement since the anti-Vietnam War years of the late 60s. I'm also encouraged because I look at my students, and I have never seen, I've been p teaching since, well, since the beginning of the, of the 1980s, I have not come across a generation of students, of young people that are as committed, as engaged, as dedicated, as idealistic, as determined to change the direction of this country for the better as this generation of young people. including high school people, those kids in Florida. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And I'm also encouraged because so many people are so determined to save our democracy. These are trying times for many of us. I don't know how your blood pressure is. I try to distract myself every day. I go on little vacations. 
I try not to get burnt out. But I just want to tell you that your engagement and involvement is critically, critically important. So thank you all. And now, um, Clara. All right. Well, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Reich, former U.S. Secretary of Labor and author of the new book, The Common Good. I'm going to ask a few questions of my own, as well as mix in some questions I've been given by all of you. Um, you know, you make a very stirring call for us to listen to the better, better angels of our nature. But if one thing has become clear in the Trump era, it's that we've relied on customs to serve as guardrails around politicians and others and not rules and laws as much as we probably thought. And I'm wondering if there's a rule or a law or two you think that we should really be fighting for in the, in the relative near term, something that's accomplishable. Uh, well, the only uh, set of rules and laws that I think are absolutely essential are rules and laws that get big money out of politics. And, and Clara, I say that uh, because uh, I think this is one of the roots of the problem. It's not the only problem. Uh, but the difference that I have seen over the last 50 years, one of the biggest differences is the amount of money in politics, a lot of it big money, a lot of it coming from very wealthy people, big corporations, uh, and Wall Street, and it distorts the process, and it makes people even angrier, and it gives them a bigger, uh, a kind of a, a stronger sense that the game is rigged against them, and unfortunately it is. I mean, it was pretty amazing to hear Mick Mulvaney uh, admit, the head of OMB and, and now the <laughs> Consumer Protection Finance Bureau, um, that he, he basically admitted what I guess we've kind of always known, that he gives his time and effort to the big donors and pretty much not anyone else. Well, and Donald Trump during the campaign said when he was asked, do you give big money and why? And he said, yes, I give money because that's, they, they will call me. They will return my calls and they'll do what I want. I mean, he, both Mulvaney and Trump uh, and others uh, are saying things that everybody knows. And in a way, uh, it's shameful, but in a way, it's admirable that they're at least telling the truth. Well, speaking of shame, uh, you, you call for basically resurrecting the idea of shame in American politics and um, in the public sphere, which is you know, not a historic rallying cry for liberals. Um, can you tell us what you mean? Uh, yes, I, I think that it is important for us, uh, and that's in a chapter where I, I talk about shame, but also honor. Mm. Uh, it's important for us to honor uh, acts that are really on honorable in terms of the common good, in terms of promoting the processes and institutions that are, are really give ve concrete vent and expression to our ideals, uh, and also shame people and institutions that don't. I mean, the fact of the matter, the, the mere fact that not a single Wall Street executive uh, went to jail, uh, the fact that Congress continues. Uh, to haul various people before Congress for perp walks, but then doesn't do anything about what they have done. Uh, you've got people like Martin Shkreli, uh, who uh, you know, ultimately goes to jail, but Congress called him in front of Congress when he raised the price of that very rare drug, 5,000%, uh, uh, and then members of Congress did not do anything legislatively uh, to make it impossible, once again, for, for members, uh, for CEOs to do something like this. There, there are no controls on, on drugs. This, this, to me, is the essence of, of shameful behavior. Uh, we've got to attach consequences to bad behavior. Uh, on the honor side of the continuum, let me just say that I, I think it's great uh, that wealthy individuals may give a college or a university or a museum a lot of money and their, their names are up. But why don't we also honor 
the whistleblowers and honor the social workers and honor the, the teachers and the, uh, the people who are the first responders? Uh, why don't we have uh, a way of, even universities should be providing honorary degrees uh, to some of the unsung heroes of this country so that we have, young people have examples of how, what citizenship actually means. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder what you would tell parents and others what to do for modeling to their kids when they have a president who seems to be immune to shame and has no real honor of, as well, we typically uh, describe it. How do we, how do we explain that? Well, I, I think it's what, what kids respond, I, mean, I remember as a kid, I was sitting there, uh, we were one of the first families on our block to actually get a television. It was only, the, the tube was, so, it was about this big, and my father got it because he wanted to watch the Army McCarthy hearings. Mm. And we sat there, and I was a very small boy, and um, all I remember is uh, watching Joe McCarthy, uh, and, and I don't know how many, I'm just looking at some of your, um, just trying to determine how many of you might remember the Army McCarthy hearings. <laughs> some of you might. Uh, and Joe McCarthy really did go on a communist witch hunt, and my father thought it was not only shameful, but every time McCarthy was on television, my father would start swearing. And I never heard my father swear. Well, that instilled in me uh, a kind of sense that there is right, there is wrong in the public sphere. Uh, it was a kind of crude way of doing it, but if you have children or grandchildren and you don't like what you see in the public sphere, <laughs> you might gently swear. <laughs> That, that, that makes me feel a lot better about my ranting while I watch at CNN. Um, how does hyperpartisanship and polarization in American politics affect our society, and maybe most importantly, our ability to make good policy decisions? Uh, well, it's awful. Uh, it makes it almost impossible. Uh, one of my dearest friends from my years in Washington uh, was, and still is, a Republican. Uh, he was then uh, a senior Republican senator, and that hyperpartisanship just started, just started, as I said, with Newt Gingrich, and his name is Alan Simpson. And Alan and I, uh, it got so partisan there. I mean, we're talking about the, the late 1990s that Alan and I had to sneak out to have lunch together because uh, his staff told him, you know, don't be seen with that, that labor secretary. And my staff told me, don't be seen with Alan Simpson. And so it was like going, you know, it was like having a little affair. We had to just, <laughs> uh, but these days it's much, much worse. These days uh, you don't even have the staff or the, even the summer interns talking to each other across the aisle. Uh, I tell my students, and this is something that I think we should tell each other, and I try to remind myself all the, all the time, the best way of learning is to talk to people who disagree with you. Because it forces us to sharpen our arguments, to rethink where we are, to make sure that we, our assumptions are right. Uh, given how easy it is to surround ourselves just with people who agree with us, uh, to go on the internet and have just the algorithm respond in a way that only we see things that confirm our biases, how easy does, is it for us to pretend or forget that there are other points of view and that po possibly they are correct? You know, if you could go back to any point since Kennedy's uh, inaugural speech, what's the one thing that you do or undo in the hopes of creating a, you know, a timeline that was where the common good was more valued? Well, for me, I think one of the great tragedies, uh, and it is also poignant given this building, is the demise of the labor union movement. Uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s, one out of three American workers in the private sector was unionized. And that was enough to give workers, employees, a huge amount of bargaining leverage. Because even in the non-unionized sector, we had employers who said, well, if those wages and working conditions and benefits are going to be applying there, I better do the same thing or I'm gonna be unionized tomorrow. Well, now in the private sector, we have fewer than 7% of our workers are unionized. Uh, and that means there's basically no, no 
leverage at all. There is no bargaining power. There is no, there is no voice. And Harry Bridges, wherever you are, you know and you've seen it. And it is a huge, huge problem. Uh, my mentor at Harvard, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, wrote a book in the early 50s called American Capitalism, The Concept of Countervailing Power. And that book basically proposed, and I think he's right, that the most important legacy of, from the New Deal was the creation of countervailing centers of power like labor unions or like farm cooperatives or like uh, retail chains, all of which could countervail the power of monopolies or big business or even Wall Street, uh, and that countervailing power is gone. I'm curious, you know, today we're seeing calls that uh, probably are somewhat reminiscent to your time in the Clinton administration for more means testing and and kind of more restrictions on social insurance of various kinds. When you look back to the uh, welfare reform of that era and what's re returning now, not only what do you think that's doing to the people at the lowest end of the economic sector, but what do you think it's doing to the, to the broader middle class? Well, first of all, we've got to be very clear about this. The middle class is eroding. There was a great statistical battle going on among researchers years ago about whether that was really true. How do you define the middle class? Is it really eroding? It is. Uh, and at the present rate, uh, well, we are going to have a, a, a fairly small portion of this population that is very wealthy, and a lot of people who are uh, not poor, but close to poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you get into artificial intelligence and the effect of technology on jobs, we're going to see a much, much greater problem than we have right now. So what do we do about it? Uh, well, uh, I think one of the reasons I'm optimistic is I'm beginning to hear more politicians say things like um, a guaranteed basic income. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of people I talk with who are in the high technology sector who are really right here, um, just on, in San Francisco and south of San Francisco, uh, executives who are telling me that they want advice on how to put you know, uh, kind of a, a basic income, a universal basic income on the agenda. Uh, we are also seeing politicians, mostly Democrats, talking now about a guaranteed federal job if there is no other job. All of, this, all of these policies are big enough, Clara, that they could restore some bargaining leverage. Because, for example, if there's a guaranteed federal job, uh, people don't have to accept uh, a, a lower paying uh, and, and uh, a more contingent job. They can say, well, I can go elsewhere, and that forces the private sector to do a better job. Do you actually see um, folks outside of Silicon Valley really start to talk about the, the you know, automization and AI's threat to jobs? Because it's something like one, one in three jobs is estimated to be gone by 2050, I think. I, I, it's happened very suddenly. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to uh, the Bay Area 12 I think it's because we ran a big article on it. That's I'm going to take credit. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's your article that did it, yeah, actually. I uh, no, I, I, it's, it's been, uh, it's been s fairly sudden, mm -hmm. the interest in all of these things. There are a number of big ideas out there, uh, and I don't think they would be there uh, were there not a, a demand for some large solutions to dealing with almost what, what almost everybody is now seeing as a fundamental problem. Uh, well, I could go on, but. So I'm getting quite a few questions about um, wondering what you are, when you look back at the Clinton, the Bill Clinton's administration, um, what are the regrets that you have about what was done under that administration, be it welfare reform or deregulation of Wall Street? Uh, well, you, you touched on the two big ones. Uh, welfare reform was not really welfare reform. I, I think that Bill Clinton recognized that we couldn't continue politically having the same old welfare system we did. But to move from that to a five-year maximum in somebody's entire life, uh, years on welfare, when you have a business cycle, it hasn't been repealed. Uh, there are a lot of people who, after the Great Recession, don't 
have any eligibility for welfare at all, again, any public assistance, that's a huge problem. Uh, I think uh, also the deregulation of Wall Street that started before the Clinton administration, but certainly uh, getting rid of Glass-Steagall mm -hmm. uh, was a mistake. And it was also a mistake not to listen to Brooksley Bourne, who at that time was head of the Commodity Future Trading Commission, which she, she said to the Clinton administration, you have got to regulate derivatives. You've got to allow us to regulate derivatives. And Bill Clinton and Larry Summers and Bob Rubin said no. Um, it's interesting because back to the uh, universal basic income idea, you know, I, I, I I think that it's a kind of technocratic solution in a way that, that Silicon Valley likes, but I think they also recognize earlier and more than most the threat that this poses to jobs and maybe to the society at large. Um, but Wall Street, I feel like still, I don't get the sense having talked to friends who are pretty high up in some of those firms that there's not a sense that such rampant inequality could ever come back and, um, you know, affect, affect the rich in a dramatic way. I think you're absolutely right. I, I do sense, I think that the Silicon Valley has an understanding that if you lose a middle class, at the very least you lose customers. Right. I mean, who's going to buy all these fancy gadgets right. if everybody's poor? Uh, I think Wall Street is in a different world. Um, I, I wrote an article, a column, my column for the, the uh, Chronicle uh, Weekly, well the Sunday column uh, takes a lot of CEOs to task, particularly Jamie Dimon, mm -hmm. who's now head of the Business Roundtable uh, and also CEO of the biggest bank, uh, Morgan Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and uh, I don't know how he got a hold of it, but this afternoon he called me, and he was furious. Uh, and, I, and I said to him, uh, well, I... He seems to do that a lot. Call people up for... Does he? Yeah. I, I, I well, know. anyway, I didn't let him get away with it. I told him... It is, you know, he is in a position, if anybody is in a position, the head of the business roundtable, the head of the biggest bank in this country, to focus the attention of the business community on what is happening to most Americans and what is the political result of this and why we are living with the political result and it will get only worse if we, if the plight of most Americans gets worse. And I said, and I called him Jamie, I said, what are you gonna do about this? I did not get a very satisfactory answer, but <laughs> I told him to think about it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I sent him my book. <laughs> Good. I mean, regarding income inequality, uh, you took note of a really fascinating bit of research um, showing that how uh, bad passenger behavior on planes increases if coach passengers are made to walk through first class as opposed to kind of coming in through the side there. And again, like, what's the takeaway from that for us, but especially the, you know, the sort of super rich? Uh, this is, by the way, this is not new. No. I mean, the, we went through in the 1880s, 1890s, something that was then called the Gilded Age. Uh, we're now in the second Gilded Age. But in that first Gilded Age, there was a lot of discussion of conspicuous consumption and its effect on the kind of demoralizing of the public, not just anger, but a sense that people, people felt bad about themselves. Uh, they felt that uh, if this is a meritocracy, and there are a few people making off like robber barons, and that was what we called them, uh, and most people are doing worse and worse, uh, then what's, you know, then it can't just be me, it's gotta be something that is larger than me. Uh, and, and here's another reason that I'm optimistic. This country has a history of resilience. Every time, like in that first Gilded Age, we have huge inequality and we have people who are incredibly poor and starving and we have extraordinary wealth and corruption. I mean, corruption in those days makes today's corruption uh, seem like pikers by comparison. Uh, what did we do? Well, we reformed our system. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the accidental president, uh, came in and started busting up the monopolies, the trusts with the antitrust laws. Uh, we instituted food and drug laws. We actually stopped that kind of corporate corruption. Uh, we outlawed as a country, we, we said CEOs, 
what businesses can no longer give directly to politicians. There, there was a, an era of progressive reform uh, that continued actually in the 30s with Teddy Roosevelt's fifth cousin, uh, Franklin D. Uh, I think that we are ripe for another era, era of reform. You know, you, you talk about the, uh, the lack of civic education that young people are getting and have gotten for the last um, you know, few generations. Should we make that part of the benchmarks for state and federal curriculum? Should we, you know, instead of just math and reading, should we really try and put that in there? As long as we're going to teach the test, we could teach them about the Constitution? Yes. Uh, and I'll, How many of you, when you went to high school had a course in civic education. Put up your hands. Well, a number of you. I would say maybe 20 of you. <laughs> um, I, I did. Uh, it, was not, it was not a particularly good course. It was a course I had as a freshman in high school, and I, it was taught by a, a rabid anti-communist who just put up maps of, of the world showing it getting redder and redder, and, the, and other places around the red, big, big red areas were you know, kind of had red stripes, like they were just about to succumb. But nonetheless, the, the classes did cause me and also cause my classmates to talk about current events, about public policy, about the founding documents, about really what we were all doing together, what we owed each other as members of the same society. That's the issue. And if we don't talk about what we owe each other as members of the same society, uh, the issue that John F. Kennedy raised, uh, then we are not educating our young people. We're not even educating ourselves. You um, propose, as others have, that we, we should require a year or two of public service from every young American. I presume that sometimes in the faculty lounge of Berkeley, you're hanging out with some economists. What would they say about that in terms of well, I don't want to disparage any of my <laughs> colleagues, and it's not, I mean, there, 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 there is a counter view, and that is that public service should never be coerced. Well, I understand that, but we do require that young people go to primary and secondary school. I mean, there are a lot of things that we require of young people. To ask them to put in two years of public service doesn't seem to me to be outrageous, and until 1972, there was a draft. Some of you may remember the draft. Now, it is true that the more connected you were and the higher your income, the less likely you were to go. But at least we were reminded of a public duty. I, I, I think it's important. Uh, and I would very, very much advocate, and I do in the book, uh, reasons for why some two years of public service of a certain kind should be required. If you were uh, asked by President Trump, what would you do to advise him on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? I don't think he'll ask me. I don't either, but... <laughs> I don't. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as it was constructed, uh, had a flaw, and it was a big flaw. The first, actually a small version of that flaw was in NAFTA. Mm -hmm. And we didn't pay attention to it. We didn't even see it. But it is a state individual, a state corporate dispute mechanism that allows any corporation, any global corporation, uh, to allege that any health, safety, environmental, or even securities or labor regulation is a, basically a trade barrier that is hurting the company and therefore the nation that is guilty of that trade barrier has got to compensate that company. Well, the problem is, and it should be obvious, once you have that in there, you have a, a very chilling effect upon a lot of important health, safety, environmental protections. Uh, and that would be used. I, so I, I, was, uh, was, I was not upset when Donald Trump decided uh, that he would not support the TPP. In fact, I was surprised. It's the one thing that we agreed on. And then, of course, in the last few weeks, he's decided he's going to support it again. And I. But if you could get rid of that 
clause, that provision, would would it be on the whole a good thing for the environment and uh, well, workers? I would I would I would want to revise it slightly with regard to environmental mm -hmm. and, and labor standards, mm -hmm. and we could get into the weeds a bit of on this, and I don't want to, but I think that um, for years we have not paid adequate attention to environmental and labor standards in our trade treaties, and we can do it without creating unconscionable trade barriers. Um, you know, you and I were talking uh, backstage about a new study that came out. Um, it's not the only study that's come out to show this, but that basically has said that um, Trump voters were not motivated by, quote, economic anxiety so much as essentially fear of losing white privilege. Um, and you said you, you found some flaws with that particular study. I'm just wondering if you would talk a little bit more about this. This has been a big you know, post-election debate of you know, which, which is the overwhelming factor here. Well, I think it's a, it's a bit of a false, misleading, and bogus debate because we have had racism and xenophobia in this country since the founding of the republic. We have had white male privilege since the founding of the republic. I think what's new is that the last three and a half decades, you have, in addition to all of that, you have stagnant or declining real wages for so much of the population. And so when you have so much of the population angry and anxious, they will latch on to any demagogue who comes along and uses scapegoating as a vehicle for expressing and transmitting that rage, mm -hmm. unless you have another party called the Democrats uh, who come up with some bold ideas that actually could work or implement some bold ideas. Uh, so I don't think it's either or. I think it's, the com it's a diabolical combination of economic frustrations combined with bigotry uh, and, the, uh, and demagoguery. Do you think that a third or fourth or fifth party would help break the logjam of hyper-partisanship? And do you think it's possible just given the way we're constructed? Uh, well, given that we are, our constitutional system is a winner-take-all mm. system, uh, a third party always has drawn votes away from the one of the two major parties closest to it ideologically. Uh, and that's the way, instead of getting the lesser of two evils, when people think that they're voting for the lesser of two evils, if they decide to vote for a third party, they and actually get the worst of two evils. Uh, so it's it's tricky. I, I tell people that if they want, if they don't like what's happening, if they're Democrats, but they don't like what's happening in the Democratic Party, and they would like a third party or they'd like to be independent, uh, they might consider one of two alternatives, and that is number one, creating the equivalent of a Tea Party inside the Democratic Party that. Mm exerts a lot of influence, like the Tea Party did or has on the Republican Party, uh, that, uh, that, close, that more closely resembles your values if you don't like what the Democratic Party is doing. And secondly, uh, another option is ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. Because ranked choice voting does al allow third parties essentially uh, to, or third party candidates to have uh, more, of a, more of a chance. Although we could end up with a jungle primary situation, perhaps in Southern California, that could knock out the Democrats and Dana Rohrabacher. We're rides, already going rides. to have a jungle primary <laughs> in California. Yeah. Um, do you, what do you think the role of the prosperity gospel has been in the um, acceptance of income inequality? Well, if you, if by, clarify, if you mean by the prosperity gospel, uh, you're talking about the notion that as long as you get growth, uh, everybody's going to do better. Is that what you mean? Kind I of mean version, more the down economics? no. I mean more the uh, belief among some evangelical Christians that essentially like doing doing well is proof of goodness, and so oh. not doing well is proof of some kind of not goodness. Uh, well, again, you know that's been with us in this country since Calvinism. Yeah. Uh, in the 18, early in the 18th century or 16th century, 17th century, uh, I think that uh, that view is completely understandable. But I thought you were getting at something else. Most Americans believe in meritocracy; that is the national religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it is hard for people to 
give up their notion that if somebody's rich, they must have earned it, mm -hmm. and if somebody's poor, that must be because there's a fault in them, mm -hmm. and understand, rather, that the system can very arbitrarily reward people based not on any merit, but on luck, or on where they are, or whose children they were. You know, if you really, I tell my students, I, I teach a, a big course at Berkeley on wealth and poverty, I tell them, you know, the most important choice anybody makes in life in terms of their future outcomes is who their parents will be. <laughs> and it's a hard choice to make for most of us. <laughs> You know, Trump's Make America Great Again really evoked a nostalgia for his followers, uh, and I think we've talked a little bit about when they were sort of the clear winners in our society. Um, and I, I couldn't help but wonder, after reading your book, that if one of the reasons we've retreated from a notion of the common good is because it was only ever good for some. Well, that, I think, again, goes back to my not treating the past with rose-colored glasses. Uh, you know, the 30 years between 1946 and uh, 1976 uh, was a golden age in the following respect. Everybody's income increased, and people in the bottom 20% increased their incomes faster than people in the top top 20%. But we still had terrible inequalities of particularly race and gender, and yet, Having lived through those years, I can tell you that there was a recognition that we had to get on with a job of overcoming those barriers. I mean, the Civil Rights Act was a major, in fact, remarkable achievement. The Voting Rights Act, an incredible achievement. Uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid, uh, the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, think of the impact that all of those had uh, relative to any legislative legislation that's come since. What, what do you make of the fact that, you know, so-called, and I, I mean, I shouldn't put it that way, the good Republicans who worry about the same things um, aren't speaking up. And I would also say the same, be they Republican or Democrat or what have you, of business leaders and other people with large sway over our country. Well, this was the, really the, the discussion that Jamie Dimon and I had this afternoon. Um, if business leaders don't speak up, if Republican leaders don't speak up, who is going to speak up that is going to have any credibility? I mean, if Democratic leaders speak up, and they are speaking up, people just easily attribute it to partisan politics. Mm -hmm. And some of it, yes, obviously, right. is right. partisan politics. So. Uh, going back to something that Martin Luther King Jr. said, and actually, if it goes all the way back to the Greek philosophers, uh, it's not so much the bad actions of the worst people, it's the silence of the good people that gets a society deeply into trouble. And when you put that to Diamond, or I imagine you've put that at least hypothetically to others, what, what do they say? Is it fear that Trump's going to tweet something and J.P. Morgan Chase's stock is going to plummet? Or like, what, what, is the, what is the fear there? I can get why you know, members of Congress are fearful that their base is going to not turn out for them, perhaps. But Well, let's first of all take members of Congress, then yeah. we'll go to others. I mean, members of Congress who are Republicans, they are looking at the polls, and 70% of registered Republicans are still supportive of Donald Trump. So if you are a member of Congress, and 70% of your Republicans support the president, it's going to, I mean, you, you have to do a mental calculation about whether you want to be Continue. on a suicide mission, uh, and whether your scruples are more important. I mean, I would like to think that everybody in this room we do that calculation and find that your scruples are more important, but I think that's not necessarily realistic. Uh, I think the business community is different, uh, particularly big business and particularly Wall Street. I don't think it's that they fear a Trump tweet. I think it's more what we were alluding to before. They live, they're living in a different world. They're not, they're not confronting the reality of what's happening every day to Americans. And that goes back to the bubble again. I mean, we, we are living in these bubbles, and it's a lot to expect. I mean, being rich in America today means essentially not coming across anybody who's not rich. Right. 
because we are in different worlds. Yeah, I mean, it makes you wonder if it's going to take an equivalent of like the draft riots to kind of snap people out of that that safe bubble. Uh, well, I, I hope not. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, you, you wonder, I can't help but wondering, given that Donald Trump is so good at selling, he's so good at marketing, his, his real talent is not managing, let's be clear. <laughs> Trump stakes, come on. It's not at vetting. <laughs> no, not vetting. Uh, I mean, his real talent is marketing and uh, selling and doing whatever it does to make a sale, uh, which is okay, I guess, if you're a realtor or in real estate development, not realtor, real estate development, but uh, it is obviously quite dangerous under these circumstances. And you have, again, much of the public, and I talk to Trump voters all the time, and many of them have a kind of buyer's remorse. Uh, they do say, I thought it would be better or I'm embarrassed by the tweets, but a lot of them are still harboring a sense that the system is rigged. When Donald Trump talks about the deep state, mm -hmm. what he's really talking about in terms of the people who voted for him is the establishment, the elites that are running everything. And that is neither a Republican nor a Democratic issue. I think the future, polit the future political division in America is not Republican versus Democrat. The real division is either authoritarian populism or what we might call progressive or Democratic populism. And the Democratic populist message is we've got to reform the system fundamentally. Mm -hmm. save our democracy, get big money out of uh, our, our politics, and so on. How are you feeling, uh, what's on you know, a scale of 1 to 10, how are you feeling, on, uh, what's your level of optimism about how the post-2016 Democratic Bernie Sanders shakeout has happened? Do you think that we're getting past relitigating that election, or...? Well, it's too, uh, my optimism, I would say, on a scale of 1 to 10, depending on what 10 is. <laughs> good. That's ten it's about a 7. Yeah. Uh, because I think that certainly uh, Democrats and progressives I come across say the most important thing in 2018, at mm -hmm. least, is to take back this, the House, which uh, I think is possible. Uh, I don't think it is, well, it may be possible, anything is possible to take back the Senate. I think it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Anybody's fooling themselves, thinking how easy it's going to be. It's going to be hard to take back the House, yeah. but I think it's more possible. Uh, but 2020 is a different issue. I think uh, leading up to 2020, there could be a reemergence of some of the some of the fights in the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders, I predict, is going to run again. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Joe Biden is going to run. This is my prediction. This is not based on any internal special knowledge. I'm just reading the tea leaves based on somebody who knows, has been reading tea leaves for a long time. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think that that could set off a similar kind of fight to the fight we saw before. I hope not. Uh, would you only put those two up in the stratosphere of people that you expect to be real contenders? Uh, well, I think that we might very well see as many Democrats running for president in, for 2020 as we saw Republicans run uh, in, uh, in, in 2016. Uh, that went but, well. I'm sorry? That went well. <laughs> yes, that went terrifically well. Um, I mean, there, there are many people who, uh, in Washington, I know, love to be talked about as a Republic as a as a presidential aspirant because mm -hmm. once you're talked about as a as a presidential aspirant you get People a lot of attention yeah, yeah. and whatever you say becomes big news. Uh, but uh, I've been looking at these elections for so many years. It takes much more to run, and I don't mean just money. Uh, it takes nerves of steel, and I think you also have got to be a pathological narcissist. Yeah. I hate to say that, I, I really do, uh, but I, I think it's these days, uh, it's very, very hard for a normal person. 
Good. <laughs> so yeah, I have to look forward to a future of even greater pathological nurses. No, no, there's some... Ni- <laughs> now, wait a minute. Uh, I, I, there's some very capable and well-meaning pathological narcissists. Oh, good, okay, good. All right, well, I feel relieved. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I would just like to, on behalf of uh, the Commonwealth Club, thank Robert Reich, professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley, former U.S. Secretary of Labor, author of The Common Good. Um, thanks to everyone here as well and our audience on radio, television, and the internet. Uh, Professor Reich will, Reich will be signing books out in the lobby, uh, or no, actually up here on stage, and he'll be pleased to sign them. You're going to get some more instructions um, immediately following the program. I'm Claire Jeffrey of Mother Jones, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>